నందిని సుందర్ అంటే మనకు పెద్దగా తెలియకపోవచ్చు గాని ఛత్తీస్గఢ్ లో ఆమె పేరు తెలియని వారు బహుశా ఉండరేమో యాభై ఏళ్ల నందిని సుందర్ ఢిల్లీ యూనివర్సిటీకి చెందిన ఢిల్లీ స్కూల్ ఆఫ్ ఎకనామిక్స్ లో సోషియాలజీ ప్రొఫెసర్ పర్యావరణం అంటే ఆమెకు అంతులేని ప్రేమ అంతేకాదు పచ్చని అడవులను నమ్ముకుని ఉండే గిరిజనులంటే అంతులేని అభిమానం మావోయిస్టులకు వ్యతిరేకంగా ఛత్తీస్గఢ్ లో రూపుదిద్దుకున్న సల్వా జుడం ఆగడాలపై సుప్రీంకోర్టులో ప్రజా ప్రయోజన వ్యాజ్యం వేశారు సల్వా జుడం నిషేధం వెనుక నందిని సుందర్ కృషి చాలా ఉంది ది బర్నింగ్ ఫారెస్ట్ ఇండియా స్వారిన్ బస్తర్ అనే పుస్తకంలో మానవ హక్కుల ఉల్లంఘనను కళ్లకు కఠినట్టు వర్ణించారు నందిని సుక్మా జిల్లాలో శ్యామనాథ్ బాగేల్ అనే గిరిజనుడి హత్యలో నందిని సుందర్ పాత్ర ఉందని ఆరోపిస్తూ ఛత్తీస్గఢ్ పోలీసులు ఆమెపై కేసు నమోదు చేశారు సామాజిక గుర్తింపు తెగలు కులాలు ఆధునిక భారతంలో రాజకీయ విజ్ఞానం సామాజిక గుర్తింపునకు సంబంధించి చేస్తున్న విశేష కృషికి గాను ఇన్ఫోసిస్ సంస్థ నందిని సుందర్ కు రెండు వేల పది ఇన్ఫోసిస్ బహుమతిని సత్కరించింది ఢిల్లీ యూనివర్సిటీ సోషియాలజీ ప్రొఫెసర్ అండ్ హ్యూమన్ రైట్స్ యాక్టివిస్ట్ నందిని సుందర్ వాజ్ అక్యూజ్ ఆఫ్ ద మర్డర్ ఆఫ్ అ ట్రైబల్ అండ్ బస్తర్ బై ద ఛత్తీస్గఢ్ పోలీస్ దెర్ ఇస్ సంథింగ్ కాఫ్కాస్క్ ఇన్ దిస్ బిజార్ అక్యూజేషన్ One has heard of the wonderful work she has been doing in the Bastar area in Chhattisgarh for close to two decades and so this sounded preposterous. As Professor Nandini Sundar is in town, we decided to speak to her and hear what she has to say about her work with the tribals and what led to this inconceivable accusation. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today, in, uh, Professor Nandini Sundar. Thank you. And um, on behalf of our viewers at Sakshi, I welcome you first to the city of Hyderabad and to our studios. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, let's hear it from you, uh, this journey that you had. First of all, as a student of sociology, uh, to working as an activist in the forests of Bastar. How did this happen? Uh, I'm still a student of sociology, so <laughs> actually those are in a way two separate parts of my life. But um, and in a way they're not separate either because uh, the reason uh, why I got active on the human rights violations mm. happening in Chhattisgarh is because uh, precisely because I went there as a student first in 1990 mm -hmm. and I love the place so much that I can't bear what's happening to mm. it uh, now the kind of uh, mass violations mm. people being displaced uh, the rapes you know it's really tragic to see uh, so it's sort of part of the research that I've been doing over the last 26 years. Was there any, mm. I mean, any parental restrictions from your family? How did they allow you to just go into the forest like that? <laughs> uh, I can imagine <laughs> my mother putting her foot firmly down and saying, no way. Uh, my parents are very supportive, actually. They're both, mm. um, you know, I was living in, in 1990 when I was living in a village. I would, they would insist that I would, I should call home. Okay. every week so mm -hmm. I'd have to go 70 kilometers to make a phone call in those days you didn't have any cell phones, cell phones or anything there was one PCO in mm -hmm. the uh, city so uh, but apart and now because of the way that the Chhattisgarh police is hounding mm -hmm. everybody journalists right. lawyers mm -hmm. so now they're worried but mm -hmm. otherwise they are quite relaxed and your husband now husband <laughs> is really <laughs> relaxed <Worried. laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay mm -hmm. and then uh, so, how was mm. it then? Uh, you've talked about it in your book. You said it was very pleasant back then. I'm talking about more than two decades ago. How was the landscape of Bastar then? It's one of the most beautiful forested places in this country. It's incredibly beautiful. Uh, only now it's so tragic that every five kilometers the security forces are cutting down um, the forest and building these barbed wire camps and the kind of you know uh, projects that they're planning will basically mean that every uh, around Jagdalpur every 20 kilometers there'll be some steel plant they'll, it's going to it, they're really really changing the landscape the and um, even the environmental report on the board on the Raughat project said that if they continue with this project it's going to mean huge devastation for biodiversity for the drainage of the valley um, it's mm. so tragic because this is an area that could have been developed as a biodiverse area where mm. you know local knowledge is valued and you know some construction but what on. do you think was the watershed moment like you know that changed this whole uh, thing um, 
was it something that happened at one shot or was it some gradual change that occurred post liberalization you know this lust for land and greed for mining so did mm-hmm. it happen in a, at a slow pace i think the turning point was 2005 when um, several things came together so for one chatisgarh has been formed as a separate state in 2000 mm-hmm. uh, the mining policy was liberalized um, the government decided that it had to you know get the maoists out and um, the maoists had also formed uh, cpi maoist in 2004 so all these factors came together and they started salvage dome which mm-hmm. basically went around burning villages it was, and I was coming to that concert movement but before the salvage dome mm-hmm. i mean how did the naxals come in first when did they come in first the naxals came in in, to, uh, in 1980 uh, i think the first squads oh. came in in 1980 mostly the local administration had been um driven away in a sense because that's what uh, got the maoist support that they helped people against the forest guard the patwari the ranger mm. you know uh, at the local level they were mm. taking up issues like land distribution so that's okay. what for 30 years they were basically entrenching themselves in the area and that became even uh, worse after um uh, the mining activity and everything started uh mining activities have been going on since 78 uh 75 78 mm-hmm. uh, with the beladela mines mm-hmm. which um have been india's largest foreign exchange mm-hmm. earner for a long time um but other parts of the uh district were not as affected mm-hmm. so beladela uh, the villages around that were very affected the waters had been spoiled with iron ore sludge oh. and uh people had you know all sorts mm. of diseases and there was very little um, kind of development work for them but um other parts of the district were not as affected as they are now so coming to the mm. salva judum when was that born and do you find any parallels to this kind of counter insurgency measures taken up anywhere at all i mean in mm. our country or outside uh oh. it started in 2005 when mm. they drew on models that had been developed elsewhere so the most famous is the british um, grouping of villages in malaya where people are basically mm-hmm. moved from their villages because they are seen as supporting the rebels and they're put into camps so that they can't support people and they are basically displaced from their land mm-hmm. uh, in india they used this most widely in mizoram where 82% of the population was displaced okay and moved into camps again except the government here kept insisting it was a peaceful people's movement it was anything yes. but a peaceful people's movement and they would recruit just anybody children also i mean yeah there lots of young mm. people in fact we have some photos of police memorials uh, to these spos which show that they were under age when they died they were called spos spo special police officers and now they called uh, district reserve guard the same kind of people you know surrendered maoists mm. who are um, being used to fight against their own people and some of them are untrained too uh s- yeah so when they first hired spos um, most of them were not even fifth class pass um and mm. they were given no training they were just given a gun and said now you go and shoot whoever you like and mm. then when the supreme court banned the use mm. of spos then they gave them some little training and gave them fake fifth class certificates in many cases okay activists all over are uh, they're often accused uh, of stalling development you know whether they, mm. if it's a mine uh, mining activity or there's a dam coming up somewhere construction of any highway or anything uh, there's always some kind of a resistance you know by the people which is sponsored by left wing extremists so what do you have to say about that i think many people want is genuine development it's not that anybody is anti development it's a question of what kind of development is it a kind of development that's only going to benefit industrialists and contractors and people who are building the mines and while everybody else is displaced mm-hmm. or is it something that's going to give people who are living on those lands a share in the prosperity that comes out of that development mm-hmm. and um you know uh, especially with climate change mm-hmm. i don't think we can afford to think of development in the old way mm-hmm. i mean it's not for the adivasis that we are really saying there mm-hmm. should be a different model of development mm-hmm. it's for the whole country, country. because and the world at large and okay. the world at large mm-hmm. right so everybody wants schools everybody wants hospitals mm-hmm. everybody wants um, employment and 
we need to figure out a way in which people can get that. That is genuine development. For some reason, not for some reason, it's quite obvious, mm -hmm. you are considered to be a Maoist sympathizer. And um, apart from this, there's this absurd filing of this absurd uh, accusation against you, you know, that you're complicit in the murder of uh, mm -hmm. the tribal called, mm -hmm. uh, was it Shamnath Bagel? Mm -hmm. How did this happen? I mean, how ridiculous is this charge? Why did this happen? It's, I mean, it's you're fighting for <laughs> the uh, the tribal yeah. there, and then you're accused of being complicit in the murder of one of them. I'll I'll just give you the background to the charge against us. But okay. right now, they have arrested seven people from Telangana who were going into Chhattisgarh on a fact-finding team, oh. including high court lawyers, journalists, mm -hmm. a leader of an Adivasi group, a leader of a Dalit group. Uh, so they this happened recently. This happened on the 25th of December. Okay. And they were handed over by the Telangana police to the Chhattisgarh police and accused of carrying one lakh in old notes for the Maoists. This is, I mean, what happened to us is part of a larger pattern where that they're trying to get rid of anybody who's critical or who will highlight any kind of violation. But in terms of what happened to us, um, actually it goes back... Um, in 2011, the Chhattisgarh police went and burnt three villages and mm -hmm. killed people, raped. Uh, so as part of our Supreme Court case, uh, mm -hmm. the court had ordered um, the CBI to investigate yes. this. So this year, after five years, the su CBI filed a charge sheet in which they said the police have burnt, the SPOs yes. have burnt mm -hmm. the villages. So immediately after that, um, the Chhattisgarh police, the IG Kaluri, uh, mm. called a press conference. He said the CBI is lying. Mm -hmm. Then the police burnt our effigies and they attacked Manish Kunjam, who is one of my co-petitioners, who is an mm -hmm. Adivasi leader there. And uh, then immediately after that, they filed this fake murder charge against us. And the wife of the person who is murdered, who she is herself has given evidence. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She's saying that she has not named anybody. She doesn't know mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, the villagers there are saying that they have not named mm. us. So, the police, and if you read the police, the complaint which the wife is supposedly given, mm. it is so clearly a police fabrication. But what is shocking is that, you know, the police are continuing to operate and get away with all of this rubbish. But they were called by the NHRC, uh, yeah. wasn't they were summoned uh, to give an explanation. Um, uh, Mr. Kaluri, the IG of Bastar, and also the chief secretary. Right. So what came out of this meeting? So the Chief Secretary went off abroad with Dr. Raman Singh. Oh. So he did not attend. And the IG uh, was uh, in hospital in Vishakhapatnam. Um, hmm. uh, he said that he had a kidney and hmm. heart problem. Mm -hmm. And um, he's come back now. And the NHRC has summoned them on the 16th. And what about the case? Supreme Court had uh, said that, uh, in fact, they conceded there, mm -hmm. the additional solicitor general conceded to the Supreme Court that uh, either investigate or arrest on the basis of that FIR. And if in future they want to ever do anything, they have to give us four weeks notice and during which time we can approach the court. So the court has given us protection for the past mm -hmm. and the future. Okay. Because they recognize clearly that you know, know. we were in the middle mm -hmm. of this whole argument you know with the CBI submitting its charge sheet and everything and the you can't win a case by uh, putting your opponent in jail <laughs> I mean what sort of a way is that of fighting a court case <laughs> okay but um, uh, statutory bodies mm -hmm. like the NHRC um, do you think they have any teeth I mean uh, can they really do anything much I think it's up to the statutory bodies um, whether they want to exercise the powers or not but they do have powers. They do have powers and they mm -hmm. should exercise them and in some cases <laughs> they have, like in Gujarat, uh, Justice Varma did take up cases. Mm -hmm. um, so. uh, coming back to the Salva Judum, uh, with reference to that PIL that you filed, uh, I think along with uh, Mr. Ramchandra Guha and uh, Mr. E.A.S. Sharma, That's isn't right, it? Yeah. Okay. So you write in your book that you were there for the judgment, to hear the judgment and you say uh, this judgment was delivered by Justice Sudarshan Reddy and Justice S.S. Nijar, isn't hmm. it? So it came as a complete shock to you, you said. Why? Why was it a shock? Uh, because we'd been in court since 2007 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm not, I mean, this is my first case okay. of this sort and, you know, we had so many hearings and each time it seems like, you know, the judges would say, okay, give one more chance to Chhattisgarh to provide a status report, what have you done? 
and this was just going on and you know we were getting kind of he thought it would never end it would never end that mm -hmm. it would just uh, chatisgarh would just get away with one more status report mm -hmm. and so it was a very pleasant mm -hmm. surprise because they had reserved orders over the summer but we didn't still okay. know what to expect so but he gave mm. a very strong order mm. but do do you think this order was implemented it was completely not implemented the chatisgarh government is so contemptuous of the supreme court uh, mm -hmm. they supreme court said clearly salvajudum by any name must be banned mm -hmm. any kind of vigilante action cannot get state support mm -hmm. it says that those spos must be disbanded and they should be used only for traffic duties or for disaster management okay uh, because using them to fight against the maoists is not only a threat to the lives of other people because they are untrained but a mm -hmm. threat to their own lives because you know they are not seasoned uh, uh, security forces yeah. so the chatisgarh government simply changed their name with effect from the date of the order from spos to armed auxiliary forces they gave mm -hmm. them more money higher salaries and better guns so mm -hmm. now they all have ak47s they are all continuing to do the same thing so but and doesn't it amount to contempt of court it is amount mm -hmm. so we filed in 2012 uh, contempt mm -hmm. of court in fact the spos after this uh renaming was so emboldened that they even attacked the CBI team which had gone to investigate so in your book uh, actually uh, i wanted to tell you that uh, i found it terribly moving there's so many mm. moving uh, in mm. in between interspersed with you know the facts that mm. you put down the data that you put on the cold facts in between there's some very very moving uh, passages so if i may i'd like sure. to just read out one uh, small passage see they say that you know it's not the difference between people that matters it's the indifference and this particular passage moved me so much because that's what i think most of us are doing we are just so apathetic we have become we just listen to news and it's become like part of our routine so that's uh, i'll just read this out uh, lying in bed at night lazily switching channels the average viewer will sometimes see the ticker below the main frame announcing three maoists killed in sukma or four crpf a man killed in bijapur if it is a major attack uh, she might find the channel turning several talking heads in different frames shouting at each other the anchor shouting at them all the civil war out there in the killing fields of bastar is replicated in the studio in the midst of the mili it's impossible to know what the real war is about or even care what she will learn is that the naxalites are irrational at best and terrorists extortionists and inhumane monsters at worst holding back the development of the country if the government is at fault it is only because as the opposition spokesperson has pointed out they have not sent in sufficient troops or the troops did not follow the standard operating procedure laying themselves open to an ambush there may be one lone voice saying something about adivasis and the need for peace talks but the anchor will not let her speak and anyway she is probably anti national so it's a good thing after 5 minutes the average viewer switches off the tv and the light and falls asleep i thought this is so typical of what is happening we listen to this yeah. news every day and we are becoming so apathetic i mean unless we actually is someone like you who actually brings it out you know mm. the, the real life stories of what are ha what is really happening there i don't mm. think we'll be moved out of our complacency and begin to feel something it's really mm. terrible but mm. tell me is it possible to even hope that there there can be you know any difference or anything uh, positive in future i really hope there will be because if colombia can uh, have peace talks with farc mm. after 40 years uh, i don't see why we can't and in fact uh at one of our hearings last year the supreme court judges actually said this that you know why can't we uh, initiate something like that mm -hmm. and uh, you know in the fark case um it's uh they had an agenda for talks uh, and there was a third party mediator and the agenda was on similar issues uh, mm -hmm. rural reform land yeah. distribution um you know 
all the victims of crimes, mm. whoever, whether the Naxalites have killed people, whether the state forces mm. have killed people, everybody should get mm. compensation. compensation. So, you know, we could have a similar process here mm. and it wouldn't be that difficult if there was political will. Exactly. And people are desperate for peace. Mm. And, you know, th there has, to, as you said, there has to be a way of bringing in humane development where mm. um, democracy really means something and it doesn't just mean that uh, You've actually you offered know. a solution of sorts saying that, you know, you there is mm. uh, this this disproportionate kind of amount spent on mm. security versus development. Mm. You've given a whole lot of um, data in your uh, book where you talk of, uh, you know, huge amounts spent on having these huge forces mm. and then on uh, anti-Naxal propaganda, crores and thousands of crores we're talking mm. about, versus the kind of development that they should be doing. Yeah. for uh, you know building mm. uh, primary basic infrastructure for schools mm. and hospitals and things like that so maybe you know yeah, that, that could be mm. a way to start i mean instead of sending in you know security forces on such a large scale send mm. in school teachers employ local there are so many people who are applying for jobs as teachers mm -hmm. hire them instead instead of hiring them as spos uh, you know that will make a huge difference to the way that people think I'm about sure. the government mm. and uh, I think peace is possible, really it's possible, if there's enough voices asking for it. That's true. And especially mm. about this uh, tribal area again, uh, Nandini, you mm. have mentioned that, uh, you know, it's actually uh, the areas earmarked as tribal, they should be coming under the purview of the governor. Mm. And in most such places, you have a governor who is with a, you know, a military background or mm. something like that. Is that so? Is it? Uh, we've seen it increasingly that, uh, especially in the northeast and now in Chhattisgarh and places which have conflict, mm -hmm. uh, it's usually somebody from a police security background. Um, but you know, the fifth schedule clearly gives the governor certain powers to administer tribal areas, uh, which governors have never done because usually they're appointed by the same ruling party. Exactly. So mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we should think about how to actually mm. you know make these schedules meaningful I found the the ending of the book especially the epilogue mm. extremely poignant and uh, mm. it has haunted me ever since I put it down you know you talk about what you wish to see there and you know about the verdant hills of Bastar and how all this kind of you know with proper development it will all grow back all the green hills will grow back and cover all the scars made because of man's immeasurable greed so I really <laughs> hope again that you know it's possible to um, uh, bring about peace but it's going to take a long time because it's not just the physical landscape but people's <laughs> emotional scars which have really developed over a, such a you know 10 years people have been living in such constant fear all the time worrying about whether they have to leave their village uh, because the way it is right now the you know you never know when there's going to be an attack on your village by the security forces they come and raid early in the morning round up everybody and arrest them so people mm -hmm. are just uh, many constantly, uh, living constantly in like they're actually last uh, earlier this year we found that they were just living in the hills around their villages they were not sleeping at home at night it's so tense all the time and people you can't have a normal life for 10 years they've been living like this and it's going to take mm. um, a lot of time for all time this for everything to, to mm. be but it is possible so we'll end on that note and hope that you know things get better and uh, thank you so much Nandini thank it's you. been very uh, very insightful and I'm sure very informative I'm sure our viewers are very happy with this Thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this.